existing 10, 12 years in the startup ecosystem, starting moving firstly from Accenture and then co-founding Udemy. After Udemy, he then was uh, interim head of growth at Lyft, uh, some of the two biggest marketplaces that we know today. Being 10, 12 years in the... Uh, and uh, then he uh, founded Sprig, which was in the food delivery space. After that, he has spent uh, three years traveling around, spending 30 days in different cultures, different cities. And recently, uh, I'm assuming most of you know, he founded Mavin, uh, which is a platform for uh, course creators to launch their courses. Uh, CBCs, we all know about CBC. Stoa happens to be a CBC for the longest of time. Uh, it was difficult for us to explain what Stoa is. And once that word came in, it just became like it. It is now part of the common vocabulary. So thank you, Gugan, for joining us. And I'm going to request you to maybe start with some opening remarks. Uh, these people are going to be part of STOA for next uh, six months. So we would love to start with some of the life lessons that you have seen over these 10, 12 years of your journey. And then Raj and me uh, have planned a few questions and then we'll open up to audience questions. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, I've been a big fan of STOA, uh, met Aditya and Raj in different ways and over the last uh, six months or so. Um, and I'm excited for everyone here to start their journey of transformation. I think one of the best things about CBCs is the opportunity to interact with people all over, in your case, all over India. Um, I assume your cohort is, is all over the country. Is that correct, Aditya and Raj? Yes, yes. Um, and to be able to take an opportunity to get to know each other and build relationships as well as to be able to learn new skills and, and help, and those will hopefully help you on your journey moving forward. You know, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of learning in general. So I think first and foremost, I just believe that if you are, you know, constantly pushing yourself to learn more and become a better uh, human and a, a better, you know, um, business person, uh, you're far more likely to be successful. And um, that is something that should never end. So one sort of comment I have for you is to both be patient and also to be vigilant. And remember that learning is a long, long-term thing. You don't have to know everything in the next you know, few weeks, um, but you also have the opportunity to learn uh, to, to, to continue to learn throughout your entire lifetime. Um, the second thing that I'll say is that get to know your fellow cohort members. I mean, honestly, the number one thing you can do in a CBC is just to interact with your peers. It's like, what makes this magical? You know, when we started Udemy 12 years ago, we couldn't get more than like a few people on a video call without having all sorts of bugs and issues and crashes and stuff. And we're all very lucky that during the pan that the pandemic happened in 2020 and 2021 instead of 2009, or even let's say uh, 1905 or 1914 as the last or 1918 when the last pandemic happened. Uh, we're all quite fortunate. We live in a much different world today, and we're able to connect. And I know that the connection that we get over inter over video is nowhere close to the same quality as what we get in person. Um, but it's still a hundred times better than having zero connection whatsoever. So uh, take advantage of it. Um, and then of course, if the opportunity presents itself, you know, meeting in person is also really nice. So I'm assuming, I don't know what it's like in India right now and it's getting worse. Is that correct? Aditya and Raj? Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. It'll get better. Uh, when it does get better, I hope you all have an opportunity to meet. We're in the opposite boat where we were locked down while you were open <laughs> um, and now we're in the reverse situation where we're still pretty locked down. I'm here in California, um, but, but it's, it's changing fast. Um, and yeah, I mean, the other thing I'll say is like, in, in my opinion, the most important decisions you make are strategic. In most people in this um, Zoom's case, that strategic decision is a decision of what to do with your career and you know it's both what role to have and then where to work mm -hmm. and i would remind you that that is far more important than how well you do the work although that's that's still critical you can't get away without doing the work well and so choose your you know your path carefully 
Uh, and also remember that you can change your path if it doesn't work out. So those strategic decisions are not permanent, but they are important. So, you know, putting time and effort into what you do and how you do it is often um, one of the most valuable things you can do, so. Got it. Uh, thank you, Gagan, for sharing that. Over to you, Raj. So Raj is going to lead the questions now, yeah. Gagan, uh, thanks. Thanks for joining us, Gagan. Uh, on that note, right, um, I wanted to start off by asking you about your journey breaking into tech uh, and startups. We have a lot of people on the call who are outsiders to the startup ecosystem and uh, one thing on their mind is how do they get in, right? How do they hustle their way in? So what was your story like and what can people learn from that? Yeah, I'll divide it into a few categories. So I think the first category is just observation. You know, um, when I first took a job out of college, I didn't know the startup world existed. Even though I grew up just 20 minutes from Silicon Valley, um, I was never exposed to entrepreneurship. My, my dad and I didn't like, we didn't ever talk about work. And then my mom didn't know many entrepreneurs. And so I grew up just like, I mean, any other California kid anywhere else or really in the United States, I'd say in, a, in, an, in, in an Asian suburb. So you have to take that into account. There were a lot of high achievers in my suburb, but I didn't know anything about like entrepreneurship at all. And so the first thing I did was I got lucky and someone introduced me to TechCrunch. This is back in 2009. And I just happened to start reading. And I think one of the best things about the internet today is that everything you need to know is available on the internet. Like, I'm not saying that, that you can always solve your problems on your own. And I don't believe in solely, you know, learning everything without peers or mentors to help. However, I will say that all the information is there. So the first thing you should do if you want to enter an industry, any industry, whether it's tech or anything else, is to observe the industry and watch the interactions. And the best thing about uh, Twitter in particular is that you can literally watch tech people interact. Like many people on Twitter have never met in person and yet they're replying to each other and you can tell that they have a relationship. So you can watch what those relationships look like and you can learn and observe those things. And I think this is one of the most important parts that most people miss is I get so many messages in my LinkedIn or in my Twitter or whatever that are just completely off base. And they're off base because the person never took the time to actually sit and observe what does work and what doesn't work. Instead, they just said, I need to get a job. I'm just going to email everyone I know, or I need to raise funding. I'm just going to message everyone I know. It's like, hold your horses, relax for a moment and, and learn. So that's the first thing I did. I spent almost four or five months um, just learning, reading every article possible. And then eventually, you know, it's like, it's like hunting or something. It's like, you're waiting, waiting, waiting. And then eventually one day opportunity struck for me. And I happened to see an article in TechCrunch and that I saw two articles in the same week. One was, hey, we're looking for interns for our mobile crunch division. Um, and then the second was, we're, uh, uh, there's a new startup incubator called the Founder Institute that you can join. Um, and I applied to both of those things right away. And of course I was lucky enough to get in. Now, how did I get in? Well, I got into the TechCrunch thing because I had been reading TechCrunch so obsessively that I knew exactly what their writing style was. I was already a fairly decent writer, but I had no real credentials as a writer. And so my submission was just me copying the style that they already wrote in, not writing in my own style, but meticulously copying the style they wrote in and submitted an application that was like them instead of like me. And that was a huge win for me because it ended up helping me get that job just based off of the application. So there was no interview or anything. It's just apply. They probably got a few hundred applications. He read through them all and he picked the ones that of course were the easiest to read because they were more like his own voice. So that was the first step. The second um, thing that happened was, uh, you know, and I think this is just reality, which is that I was just a relatively good candidate for the Founder Institute because I'd put effort in to like learning about entrepreneurship over the last couple of months. And so I kind of knew how to speak the language again. And then finally, probably the most important thing is just like 
you don't take the, you don't, you don't um, make any of the shots you don't take. I don't know how many of my American expressions work in, in India, but like, you know, it, it's a basketball expression. It's also a shooting expression. It can, it can work for anything, but essentially if you don't try, you're never going to get it. So I think the other thing that I really learned is I just tried and I tried on things that were a good fit for me. I didn't try completely just a hundred different, I wasn't shotgunning, you know, a hundred different options. I tried like every couple of weeks and eventually some things stuck. Um, and then finally, the thing that happened was I was willing to set aside my ego after I'd gotten into these two pro programs, the TechCrunch program and Founder Institute, I set aside my ego and instead of needing to be um, the like number one person on the and the founder and the co-founder of the company or the founder of the company, I ended up joining someone else's idea. So Udemy wasn't originally my idea. Um, and I think that was also incredibly, uh, it was an incredibly powerful thing for me because everyone else in the Founder Institute came in with their own idea and was super stuck on it. And instead I was opportunistic and just said, hey, let's do whatever works. And if your idea is better than mine, that's fine. I'll come join you. And I, I joined without any title or any position. I didn't know if I was even going to get equity. I had no pay. I just joined because I thought it was the right thing to do and it would be fun and it'd be interesting project. And eventually it turned into, you know, a, a big company. Thanks. Thanks for that, Gagan. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were working at Accenture um, during the same time you were juggling Udemy work as well as the TechCrunch work and Accenture. And of course, Udemy also got rejected from, you know, the now famed Y Combinator multiple times without an interview. Uh, what kept you going? What kept you uh, on this journey, right? What was it um, that helped you think through this and uh, persist? So there's two way schools of thought on this and I agree with both of them but they're completely opposite to each other so the first school of thought is you know um hey like we should be empathetic and understand that life is hard and be a little bit more aware of that challenge and I think being aware is helpful because it helps you get through some difficult times where you really need some like self-love and care and and kind of need to and so like you know I had a girlfriend at the time. I was uh, incredibly, you know, good about even, even though I was working hundred hours plus a week, I still took some time off and just shut down off the computer. You know, um, I like, I also was just honestly like young and had the energy. It's like in my, I was 21 years old, so I, I could kind of do that. Um, I'd say today I probably wouldn't do it the same way. But I had like a fair amount of balance and that's, you know, balance at 21 was working hundred hours a week balance at, you know, 33 right now is probably more like working 60 or 65 hours a week. So I don't work nearly as hard as I used to, but um, so there's a little bit of self awareness and that's critical. The second thing, honestly, is like, I just had a lot of perspective growing up traveling to India. If I'm being honest, it's all, it's, India had a huge effect on me. You know, we had servants in our house and I am sure many of you grew up with servants in your house and like my life's a hundred times better than the servants. So it's just really hard to complain. So honestly, one of the things that gets me going is nothing's really that bad. Like, you know, getting fired from a job or I don't know, like your girlfriend breaks up with you or whatever it is like, these are relatively small problems in the grand scheme of the world, right? Like, as I mentioned, if you grew up in 1918 and you were in a pandemic, your life would be 10 times harder than what it is today. You would have almost no human connection. And today, at least you can do it over a screen. You would uh, potentially not even know enough about the virus to be able to avoid the pitfalls of getting the virus. <laughs> like that information isn't traveling well. You'd have no sources of news that were ubiquitous that, you know, like you would be reading everything from the newspapers. And let's be honest, like that has been the worst source of information for the pandemic. So like you're, you're basically just getting shit info the whole time. Like perspective is so valuable. And I personally like think that there's a bit of a culture. I don't know if it's as common in India, but in America, there's this culture of like, 
woe is me or like my life is hard and like everyone needs to listen to my problems. And I think that's total bullshit. I just don't have a lot of tolerance for it. Like the truth is your problems really aren't that hard. If you're talking to me, if you've somehow gotten, you know, if you're on this call, if you're on my Twitter, like at least my, in my world and probably in most of your worlds, you got food on the table, you got a roof over your head, don't complain too much, you know? And so be aware of the problems, but don't let them consume you um, through a little bit of perspective. Thanks, thanks for that, Gagan. Uh, the other question I had was around uh, this, around the timeline on which you started uh, Udemy, right? Like you were a year or two out of college at that point of time. And um, in, in retrospect, now that I think about it, it's quite a crazy move to uh, start a company, right? So what were, you, what were you thinking at that point of time when you took that step? Yeah, I think this is what's interesting about like opportunities is if it's for me, I know people who have started companies where it's very me driven, where it's like, I really want to start a company. I'm going to go start a company. Fine. I get those people. They exist. They are relatively rare in the grand scheme of entrepreneurship. And you have to be really, really special to be one of those people. And honestly, very egotistical. Most people are in the other bucket, which is like, you know, I didn't have a real burning desire to start a company. I just had a burning desire to do something better than what I was doing. And so my standards were not super high. I wasn't like, oh my God, I need to be the next, like, you know, um, I'm Bonnie brother or something like that. Right. Like, like I just wanted to be doing something interesting and, and have a fulfilling work life. And it felt to me like startups was the only option. Now there were lots of other options that I didn't know about. And that's one of the great things about the world is there are literally, you know, you don't learn shit in school about what options there are. Hopefully at STOA you will, but you don't in traditional school. And there's actually like hundreds or thousands of different random career paths you can have. So like I could have done other things, but at that point in time, I only knew a few things. And so I was just ambiently interested in doing something in startups. And I happened to find this opportunity and this opportunity just, you know, to start Udemy just kind of worked. And I was like, all right, let me just try it. But I wasn't taking it too seriously. I wasn't like, if I don't start a startup, I'm a failure, which is the type of thinking that I find so many people have that like, I need to start a startup. I need investment. I need to find a co-founder. Like the more pressure you make it on yourself, the more likely you are to fail because that type of pressure actually exudes to other people. So other people notice that pressure and they want to stay away from you. So you want you want them, but they, they, they like, they like want to stay away from you. And then the other thing that happens is that it just clouds your judgment. And actually like oftentimes the right decision is to quit or move in a different direction or to, you know, to like take a lower role or whatever. And, and the better, the better you can separate yourself from having to achieve um, the more successful you will be. This is a particularly relevant data point for Indian, you know, Indian people because, and I'm including myself in, in that bucket because we're all raised to be like, there's a lot of pressure from our family. You know, we're often, you know, the history of, of India broadly, and you all know this better than me. So I'm just going to give you my bullshit answer of this, but like, you know, essentially until the nineties, like most of our parents were pretty poor, <laughs> like, the vast majority of, of, of Indians. And so you're like the first generation that had all these economic opportunity and there's a lot of pressure from parents and stuff because of this. And it's like, you know, you have to like learn how to take it lightly and tell your parents to, you know, honestly, for me, I tell my mom to fuck off, not literally, of course, but it's just like, chill out, like it's all good. We'll figure it out. But like, I have to bring calm and happy energy to my very, very anxious mother. And that's like in another example of like, I bring calm energy in general to situations because that makes better for better decision-making. Absolutely. I think we all need to chill once in a while, especially uh, in resource deprived country like India, right? So Gagan, um, I'm, I'm sure you wished for Udemy to, you know, blow up all of y'all definitely, you know, wished for that, but did you, imagine the effects that it is having uh, back in the day. I think Udemy, especially in India, because of the price point at which the courses are offered is 
it's opened up opportunities across the board right like did you imagine that sort of impact 10 years ago yeah i mean i i don't even think i know it now because i don't work at the company and i haven't worked at the company for like 8 years so i do hear from people like oh yeah i learned via udemy and i'm just like it's a little bit impersonal to me so even today i would say i don't really know but like i but no i mean w- here's the thing the vision was very bold from the beginning to dot democratize education and make it more accessible and that part of it we kind of knew that was possible of course cuz like you can't do something like that unless you think it's possible that you could achieve something but the human impact of doing that i don't think i ever really thought about which was both our success and our f- failure right i mean we just didn't think about people enough uh when we started the company which was a good thing because we didn't put a lot of pressure on ourselves but a bad thing cuz like the company ended up being a little bit more of a numbers driven business than a like truly like soul or like it didn't have a brand you know we didn't really build a brand now fortunately we built a, a great product and uh we provided access to a type of education that just didn't exist prior to this at a price point like you said that's affordable so we had that vision and we understood it from in, like a, a, an engineers or a uh, or a economics perspective as an economics major so the, on that level i think we kind of knew that it was possible that we could make this you know this type of education more accessible and it would be cheap and people would get that that part we get the impact it had on people i was relatively blind to i think i don't think i ever really thought about it that way i said it but i didn't really feel it or think about it fair enough fair enough um and question i have in in line with what you've written uh, about your time at udemy right like managing teams looks easy from the outside yeah a bunch of people you got to tell them to do things and that's it but it's incredibly hard uh, it is irrespective of whether you have traction or not it's hard so what advice would you give to a first time manager i think management starts inward so i have this uh, t- tweet queued up that's like um you know in order to be a uh, a sort of conscientious manager you have to be conscientious of yourself it's different than that but i don't remember it well enough so that's roughly what it says and it's true that like actually the biggest challenge of being a good manager is you know relaxing and not putting pressure the way that you know i talked about your parents putting pressure on your your employees and to just sort of trust your employees to do good work and then if they're not doing work trust that you will fire them when that happens and if you don't have trust in either of those things it's going to be very difficult to be a good manager because like most modern people uh kind of want to do whatever they want to do and they and the best people want to like go and succeed on their own and if you sort of force it all upon them you're just sort of going to going to fail um the that that's managing by the way what i would call white collar employees it's literally the opposite if you're managing you want to bring the same energy if you're managing blue collar employees um is everyone is by the way raj and aditya you absolutely need to tell me if i'm using terminology that's not yeah this um, is yeah no, we we got this um so, so people grew up you know, on it, uh, sitcoms right like so we are pretty much seeped in american yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And I, you know, I've spent a lot of time in India. Like I spent 2 months there last year or a year ago, year before that and I probably spent 12 months in my life there, so I'm not like totally ignorant to it, but I just sometimes I I speak very in a very particular way and it, you know, I just want to make sure. So anyways, um yeah, I mean, you know, calm energy is best when you're being a manager like the more calm and chill you can be while still being super attentive to detail right um so you want to be aware of all the things that are going on in your organization but also be like you know not stressing everyone out that's one thing that i really had to learn the hard way um the second thing is you know the more systematic you can make things the better so you know every week you do a one on one great like that type of ritual is extremely helpful every quarter you set goals and you evaluate the goals as well so you can't just set goals you have to also evaluate them on the back end um you know every uh you know every month you do x like whatever it is the more consistent it is 
the more likely it is to succeed and the better follow through you have on whatever process you've set up. Um, you can't just manage by telling people what to do. You have to show them that you care about what they what you told them to do. And the only way to do that is to validate and then to tell them that you validated it. So if they did well, you say like, yeah, awesome job. Uh, like, you know, and uh, if they did poorly, you tell them, hey, we talked about this, you know, it's written down here, like this didn't happen, like here's why, or let's talk about why, tell me why, and then let's figure out how to make sure we figure it out for next time. Like let's diagnose the problem. Um, a, a particular uh, framework that I've heard from my executive coach is uh, Diamonds Clubs Heart Spades. So I, I don't remember all the terms in, in Hindi, but like in Juria, um, you know, uh, Hukum and uh, what's the third one? Ban maybe is, is no, Ban and Hukum are the same. No. So what's, yeah. what, what's heart? Anyways, I was trying to practice my Hindi there, but the, the point is, it's like um, when you're giving feedback, don't give hearts. So don't say, good job. You're awesome. Amazing. Gold star. That stuff's useless. Um, uh, instead give diamonds. Um, so when you're giving positive feedback, say, uh, that project was, uh, well executed to the, the goal. We met the goals that we were saying, we wouldn't have been able to do it if you didn't show strong organization and leadership and take control. And, uh, I really appreciate that because it helps me better understand for the future, uh, you know, that I can give you projects like this and you'll take them on and I don't have to worry about it. And that's like, you see how specific and clear that was to a, to a situation that's totally made up. So in a real situation, it would feel even more clear. And then the same thing is true on negative feedback, the, the black ones, the, the hearts, the, the clubs and spades. So, you know, d don't do clubs. Clubs are, you know, um, uh, that sucked. That wasn't good work. You know, uh, you could have done better, right? That's a nice way of giving a club. Instead, give spades, give much more specific feedback. Like that's not about the person, but rather about the work. So, you know, we really didn't, we didn't achieve the goals we wanted to. And I feel like we uh, had the opportunity to, but we missed on these issues. And so you're being specific and clear while not being personal. So that's some more tactical feedback on being a good manager. Thanks, thanks, Gagan. Uh, my next question is uh, on marketplaces, right? Like the the holy grail, right? Uh, building marketplaces is not easy. You've managed to set it in motion with Udemy, and you also helped Lyft figure out their launch uh, playbook, right? So, what do initial days look like at uh, a marketplace business? They look like a ghost town. <laughs> so the biggest challenge with the marketplace is that, you know, imagine, so marketplaces and all these theories, like they apply really well in the real world. So you have markets, you know, bazaar, bazaars in, in India. Um, they aren't, nobody really calls them bazaars anymore, but like, you get what I'm saying. So, you know, you, you can go to the market and imagine that you have a street, you know, a, a street that you've blocked off on both sides and that's your market. Um, well, that isn't enough, right? So a lot of entrepreneurs, marketplace entrepreneurs start with a street that's blocked off. That's like, hey, this is where we're gonna buy and sell like, you know, uh, specialized goods. This is where we're gonna buy and sell like, um, you know, online courses. Well, the problem is you have to start by actually like, usually you have to start by supplying the marketplace with a little bit of, of love to get it started. So traditionally I say, start with supply. So most marketplaces, you start by getting the sellers to show up to the marketplace in some way. So you do whatever it takes to do that. You can be a seller yourself. Lots of marketplaces started where the first sellers were just the founders of the company or like some partner that they were really close to. We did this at Udemy where we stuck a camera in the back of a conference uh, hall and we just filmed some instructors uh, teaching. And this was before people were comfortable teaching on YouTube or on camera. So we had to literally film it with a film crew. <laughs> It's like, uh, and, uh, and so we filmed it and put courses on, 
Um, we also scraped YouTube. So we literally, there were already lots of courses on YouTube. We turned them into courses and just like scraped them and published them on our site. So we faked the marketplace. We basically started it off by putting, um, you know, putting vendors in the street, in the proverbial street. Then of course you have to attract demand. And once you have something to sell, you know, the best way to do it is just, how can I sell this individual item? Like selling the whole marketplace doesn't work when you have 10 vendors in a market opportunity of like a thousand different course topics. So like, you know, if you're selling a, you know, advanced Python course, a like management training course for women and a like, you know, SQL course, like nobody's going to come to you for tech courses. Because if you say, hey, we're a marketplace for tech courses, all of a sudden 90% of your audience is going to show up and they're going to say, well, I don't want to learn Python. I want to learn PHP. Oh shit. You don't have anything. Goodbye. I don't want to learn, you know, backend. I want to learn front end. I want to learn JavaScript. You don't have anything. Goodbye. I want to learn Excel. I don't care about SQL. Like I'm not a woman. I'm a man. Like, you know, the, like, so those three topic areas are insufficient to market the whole marketplace. What you want to do is market the individual course. So instead it's like, okay, I have a course for women leaders in tech. Let me target women leaders in tech and come up with marketing strategies that focus on that market. And let me just promote this individual course. Because surprisingly, like if you just promote that individual course, you know, people come for that course that they, they're excited about. And then they're like, oh, I just learned this great thing about, you know, how to become a better leader in a male dominated world. I'm now interested in like learning some skills because I don't have like basic, you know, SQL skills that I would like to learn in order to get this growth role I need. And then they go and learn the growth role. And so you want to sell the individual items on the supply side rather than the whole thing. So like, you know, again, in the street situation, like if you have someone who makes really good Bonipuri, like try to get a really solid Bonipuri vendor to show up and then market that you have Bonipuri on this street. Don't market that you have food on this street because like food isn't as exciting as a specific item. So that's how you get a marketplace started. Talking about food, right? Um, my next question is on Sprig. Uh, you call Sprig as uh, one of the most educational experiences of your life. Um, what, what do you know now that you did not know before starting Sprig? I think I really matured as a manager. So I learned how to manage people and what my strengths and weaknesses are. You know, one of the biggest challenges I had is I had enough empathy to care about the people who worked for me, but I also was extreme, had pretty high sort of, um, you know, expectations and was pretty direct. So I had this natural challenge as a manager where I was really hard on people and yet I wanted them to succeed. So I would just get harder and harder and harder on them instead of like, you know, what I should have done, which is I need to do a better job of just letting them succeed or fail. And if they fail, just firing them, honestly. So I used to, instead of firing them, I'd spend three or six months trying to help them improve. And that just doesn't really work. Like people just need to do it on their own or it's, or it's not gonna work. So you can help them by providing them advice, um, but you can't do it for them. Um, and so that was a big lesson at Sprig. Another lesson honestly was just how important strategy is. So you know, we at Sprig were on the cusp of a, what ended up being a hundred billion dollar plus market opportunity. So if you add the, you know, the market caps of DoorDash and Instacart, I think that's over a hundred billion just alone. And on top of that, if you add Postmates and Uber Eats, that's actually another, it probably goes up to $200 billion just in those, of course it's in modern day numbers. So who knows, maybe it's actually half that and the market crashes or something. But like the point is it's still a lot of money, right? It's still very, very um, sort of, it, it, we, we were so close and yet so far, right? So nobody, not a single company that uh, in the whole world. So I actually know companies in Australia and in Canada and in India and in the UK and France who copied our model at Sprig and nobody succeeded really. Like nobody really built a big business. So the lesson there is like, wow, the strategy you have is so much more important than you realize 
doesn't matter how good of a job you do with lots of other things, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I, I really learned the importance of strategy. And then the final thing is it just gave me a little bit of perspective, right? Like you can be really successful and then still fail. So it gave me a healthy dose of skepticism anytime something's going well or something's going poorly. If it's going poorly, it could always be worse. If it's going better, it could always blow up in your face. So that's good. That's a good lesson. Gagan, after that, you, you traveled the world, you visited uh, seven, eight countries, right? Um, and I think you were on the road for about two, two years uh, or some more. Uh, what was that time like? Because it's it's a very I mean for for folks here in India that's a very rare um, you know experience to to have. Can you share some of the stories uh, that you encountered uh, during your travel? Yeah, I I spent a year and a half truly traveling, and then another year and a half kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and career and stuff. It's a pretty lucky situation, you know, um, I, I made enough money off Udemy that I could afford to do this. Although to be fair, while traveling, I meet tons of people who have no money and who do it. So like blue collar workers who then just work a little bit while traveling or, you know, people who just, you know, live on 15 to $20 a day, which you can do in, in a lot of places in the world. Um, you know, and you can certainly do it in India as an example, um, and you can do it in, in lots, of other, uh, lots of other countries. So for me, I spent um, that year and a half, probably the most important part of it all, uh, trying to get to know the world and learn more about people all over the world. So I spent six months in Latin America, six months in Asia, six months in Africa. And within each of those places, I spent about two or three months living in one or two different cities in each of those regions. So I spent uh, a month living in Havana in Cuba. I spent two months in Medellin in Colombia. I spent uh, a month in Mumbai, a month in Shanghai, a month in Seoul in Asia. And then in, uh, in Africa, I spent about a month in uh, Nairobi and a month in uh, Kigali, um, so East Africa mostly. And the benefit of this like month long experience is that I really got to go deep with that group of people. I didn't go so deep that it took up, you know, six to 12 months or a year or, or, or two years, uh, which by the way, is a whole nother experience and also valuable. So just moving somewhere to a different city or to a different state and just working there for two years is such an incredible experience, but that wasn't my experience. I did one month because it gave me enough of an opportunity to see, you know, to learn like about this culture and to make friends in each of these cities. Like, you know, I'll probably have someone from at least half of those cities at my wedding. Um, you know, that's kind of a big deal uh, considering I was only in each of those cities for a month. But if you spend a month with absolutely nothing to do, so you're literally just like, hey, I'm here, I'm just here to learn and meet people. Like you're amazed by how much of your time you have to go and accomplish things and do things that are fun and interesting. So the outcomes of this time for me were first, I've already talked about this a lot, but it helped me gain perspective. You know, I spent time in slums. I spent time in refugee camps. I spent time with indigenous populations in the Amazon and in the wilderness of Antarctica. So I did a lot of, you know, traveling and, and sort of visiting people who were less well off. And that gave me a lot of perspective. The second thing is it helped me discover myself a little bit. I think when you work really, really hard, and this is probably true universally for people in Asia, it's not true in America, but it's true for universally for people in Asia, which is like, if you work so hard, you just don't actually grow as a social human being and as like a human. It's kind of funny, but like, you know, you spend all of 10th grade studying for these boards and basically what that means is from your, you know, whatever, 15 to 17, depending on what age you are at that time, you basically don't socialize as much as a normal human should. And you don't like, this is why the system is so stupid, but like you don't socialize, you don't do as much like, you know, you don't grow up, if you will. And so like you're going to grow up eventually or you should because you're going to want to get to the next stage in your life. And so one of the things I got to do was I just made up for lost time. And so I spent all my 20s building startups and working freaking, you know, hard. And so in my early 30s, like 30 to 32, I just got the opportunity to go and be a kid again and do stupid shit and like, you know, um, fall in love and, and uh, you know, 
stay up till till sunrise and like also just frankly just like uh you know enjoy art and and enjoy like uh things that i i thought were 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 really silly when i was younger because i was too left-brained and started to you know i spent some time in mumbai studying art which was really fun and just like visited a lot of museums and met a lot of uh, the local modern artists and those types of things were really fulfilling experiences for me i i hope that everyone uh gets to have such an experience right going ahead if not i'm sure that people ought to plan for such a thing because of course travel is definitely we have the internet but no doubt travel physically traveling somewhere is the best way of expanding uh, your mind uh, gagan coming to your yeah, hey uh, raj just just one yeah. thing on that i think what's important actually is learning is much better if there's a lot of observation and practice mm-hmm. essentially like first hand and not just second hand experiences so i believe that i learned more about the world than someone who would get an international relations degree at harvard like i actually think there's very little debate that i would know more but of course i'm i'm myself and a little bit ar- arrogant so that is what it is but my belief strongly is that i like learned more than they did and why is that it's because i spent my time literally in these countries w- talking to people getting to know them asking them questions watching how they operate like you know living amongst them living in their homes etc and that's extremely valuable so how does that apply to your journey well you're not going to be successful in business school if you don't actually do business things so you should like launch websites you should make revenue like everyone should make a dollar of revenue in business school right like make a dollar on the internet make a dollar in person right like figure out how to make money not as a uh independent not as an employer uh, employee of a company where like you know it's just like school everything structured for you and and, and that's great and like job i mean i i'm a big fan of people getting employed but learn how to make revenue on your own and you'll be a better employer like so that's practice is very important as part of education and it's totally lost in our modern education system and it's honestly even worse in india than it is in the states but it's still bad in the states so it's bad everywhere got it uh, gagan uh, we are going to come to the end of last couple of questions and uh, uh, this thread uh, i found it very interesting the superpowers thread right and uh, surprisingly even i did not discover it when you originally posted it on 3rd feb but uh, you mentioned two superpowers and i think those are relevant for people who are going through this experience for next 24 weeks and uh, intentionality and presence right like i think uh, traditional b school uh, does a decent job of giving people presence or at least giving them that confidence but i think it still does a very bad bad job on when it comes to intentionality so why do you think these two things matter and how can people actually go about building these superpowers um yeah let me uh start with presence so i mean there are lots of ways to create presence in 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 your life um and then i'll say presence most of the superpowers have dualities so the duality here is there's presence like being present and aware and observing and the best way to do that is to quiet your mind and just watch people and do a better job of ignoring what's going on in here and just like going using your other senses your eyes your your nose your your ears you know and that's just such a like surprisingly difficult thing for most people to do so they don't notice shit that's around them like i'm the type of guy who will like walk down the street and i'll be with my my now fiance and she will like point out a set of flowers that like are in someone's front yard and i'm like amazed every time this happens cuz i never notice the freaking flowers right like i never notice that beautiful tree that's on the side of the road or i don't notice the like um i notice other things but she's got a lot of presence she's incredibly good at just like walking down the street and observing and i'd say like practicing presence is something you can do in that way and then the other type of presence is like presence where you like give off good energy and stuff and ironically that comes from having the first type of presence so you will invariably be better uh you will present yourself better and have more positive energy to give out to the world if your presence if your presence on the interior is strong so that's like how i think about presence 
Um, intentionality is, you know, there's a level of like specificity that is important in internet intentionality. Like you can't just like want to be successful. That's not good enough. You have to actually have an intention that's far more specific and practical. So like you have to drill down into the details and really understand how to be, how to do what it is you want to achieve. And most people never get there. It's like, you know, if you ask someone like, how are you going to do this? It's like a classic interview set of questions, but it's like, okay, you know, you were working on this project. How did you manage the project? Oh, you know, I figured out what I was supposed to do. I asked my, my colleagues and da, 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 da. It's like, usually you get a very, very vague answer. And the only way to truly be intentional is for that answer to be highly specific. So the, the, the right answer to a question like that is, you know, I had a three-step process. This three-step process involved, you know, four sub-steps on step one and three sub-steps on step two and two on step three. And like, these are what they are. And you don't always know, like, let's be clear, you don't always need to know that answer when you're doing something, but you should be able to retrospectively go back and say, okay, this is what I did. And that's intentionality. It's like, I actually had a sort of process by which I was going about achieving the goals that I had set out for me. And I think many people get lazy and don't actually think through whether or not what they're doing on an individual basis is going to achieve the goals that they want. And they therefore lack intentionality. Got it. Uh, on that note, uh, Gagan, we are going to take a couple of questions from our fellows. Uh, Tanishka, do you want to go first? Uh, I see a question about how Gagan uh, is intentionally building Maven. So let's, uh, Tanishka, do you just want to quickly ask that question? Yeah. Uh, so firstly, uh, I'm so happy you spoke about smelling flowers. Uh, that's uh, my philosophy through life and uh, only heart eye emojis for, um, at that. But uh, so Gagan, my question to you is um, now that you're an experienced, um, uh, you have experience with multiple startups in the past. Uh, so what are some fundamentals that you worked on getting in place uh, that ABC things are sorted or this is what I'm set on before you started working on your idea for Maven or before you started executing the idea for Maven? Yeah. One thing is from a strategic standpoint, I really did a, a strong survey of all the different ways that we could go about building this company, right? We could build it like on deck. We could build it like Stoa. We could build it like, you know, we could build it like Reforge. There are so many different options out there and there were lots of other options I played with. And I spend like, I try to spend 25 to 50% on strategy of my time on strategy. Whereas at most companies, I think most CEOs and founders probably spend less than 10% of their time. So what does that mean? That means I literally spend time reaching out to people who are smart strategic thinkers and having conversations with them. It means that I actually don't take like that next sales call where I could sell the product, which is like a doing activity and not a strategic activity. And instead I give myself, you know, yesterday I just left the house after six o'clock um, and just like walked around and, and, and thought, about like strategy and thought about my biggest challenges and whether or not they're going to make sense. I talked to my customers. These are things that I think people don't spend as much time on. And, and it, they, they naturally do because you're naturally going to think about your strategy as you're building your business, but I'm much more intentional about it now. The second thing is intentionality around culture. So I always hire recruiters now. I have the luxury of being able to afford recruiters. So it's not like always easy. Sometimes you have to just do recruiting yourself, but I hire a recruiter for every freaking role. Like it's crazy. I mean, our, our recruiting system is so much more detail oriented than what we did at uh, Sprague or at Udemy. Um, and I learned a lot of this at Sprague actually, cause I happened to get uh, investment from a really top tier venture firm, Greylock and Greylock essentially taught me how to do recruiting. Um, and so I'm really intentional about recruiting. And then I'm also intentional about our values. We only have three values. You know, I can't really remember when Aditya says like superpowers thread, like this is what you said. I'm like, oh, intentionality. I don't even remember what I said, but I can recite the core values of the company like off the top of my head, right? 
ownership, rigor, integrity. Like I just know them. I know what they mean. And I'm super intentional about bringing them up at team meetings and bringing them up with uh, people on the team to make sure that we all feel that way. And, and I run the company that way. And then the third thing is this whole idea of, of being marketing driven or go to market driven. So like, I believe we're building a movement. I'm much more intentional about, you know, getting people on board with that movement, talking about it. You know, we created the name CBCs, like that was a name that I, I coined and, and sort of released intentionally into the world uh, in November when we announced our fundraising round. Uh, so there was a lot of intentionality behind the branding and the communication of the vision so that we could encourage people to feel like they're joining um, Maven on, our, on a journey that they are excited to rally behind. Got it. Uh, thank you, Gagan. I'm going to take one more question from Mahesh and then we are going to wrap it up. Hey, Mahesh, do you want to ask the question about coaching? Hey. Am I audible? Yes. Hey, Gagan, uh, thanks for your time today. Uh, I just wanted to know what, what role has played in, in your career or life in general? And I ask this because it's very hard to come across good mentors when we start off in workplaces in India. At least that's been my experience, or you know, my my colleagues and my uh, contemporaries. So I just want to want your point of view on that and be able to sort of uh, probably uh, identify mentors going forward. Some framework. I like this uh, phrase that a few people have said on Twitter. I think Naval has said this, but the best mentors you'll have are the ones you've never met. I mean, most of what I learned about life and entrepreneurship and stuff, I just learned by browsing the internet. So I don't have a specific, I do have mentors to give me information that's not publicly available. And there is a lot that I get. And I have a set of people who I go to and call every once in a while. I have no official mentors. I think that for most good mentors, they don't really want to be official mentors. They just like, want to be available when the time comes, when the question is really valuable and they want you to know that their time is being treated well. And if you just come to them with a question, they like kind of become your mentor, even though you didn't ask them to be. So my answer is I wouldn't go out and ask and look for a mentor. That's kind of like assuming that, you know, uh, God is just going to come and solve all your problems. It's like a very, it's a very like, uh, it's, it's a very sort of like, um, I don't know how to explain it other than to use religion, but it's like kind of assuming that like a higher power is going to come or a mentor who's like up and more important than you and like a guru, right? Actually, yeah, guru is the great example. Like in Indian, you know, philosophy, it's like a guru is going to teach you everything and you're going to learn and become enlightened. It's like no guru, that doesn't exist. Like you have to learn it yourself. And so I usually have like five to 10 people who at different points in my life are people who I call. Sometimes they're just my friends. They're not even my mentors. They're just my friends. Sometimes they're, uh, you know, even people, even I do it by, by being a mentor. So I'll, sometimes I just answer people's questions and it helps me think more clearly, like, you know, this call right here. So there's a lot of different ways, but I don't personally believe in being too, um, uh, needy about it. So, you know, you can't, you can't find someone who's going to solve all your problems. Like you have to solve them yourself. Uh, but Gagan, you have worked with coaches, right? Uh, on the, yeah. the, like, I mean, I get the mentor part, but the coaching. Uh... Yeah. Co coaching is different. Um, so if I'm trying to learn a specific skill or a specific, uh, you know, if I want to improve in a certain way, I will find someone who's an expert in that. So I have a coaches for literally everything. I have a speaking coach. I have a writing coach. I have an executive coach. I have a uh, coach for um, fitness. Uh, you know, honestly, if we could make Maven uh, the perfect learning experience for everyone, we wouldn't do cohort-based courses. We would just provide you with a private coach who can teach you whatever thing you need. Um, that's just insanely expensive and cost prohibitive for 99% of the population. So I'm lucky enough to be able to afford a coach for everything I do. I did not have that luxury when I was younger. Like this is a total new thing for me, but I have individual coaches for every like aspect of my life that I want to get better at. Whenever I find someone who's a good coach, I just hire them. Doctor. 
Uh, so one of the things Gagan we are doing at uh, Stoa is like uh, coaching is pretty new concept to India at such like you know there is no better up at such here, but we have got ICF coaches for everybody who is going through this experience, uh, hoping that that experiment is going to turn out well. Uh, but let's see. Uh, back to you, Raj. I have uh, one last question in uh, closing, Gagan. Uh, what are you bullish on? What are you bearish on for? the next decade to come i'll start with bearish i think that nfts and like use cases for crypto and blockchain are uh exciting but over over like it feels a bit like you know self-driving cars or like mobile did before mobile became mobile i feel like we're five to ten years early because I don't think enough people own cryptocurrencies yet for this to really work. And so I, I don't think the liquidity is going to be there in most cases. I think the, you know, there are a couple examples where it will work. So in sports, it looks like it's going to work. That's that works like the trading card thing, the digital trading card thing, maybe a few other examples, but most for, for the most part, I'm not a big believer in this be, in this happening now. I think it will happen. It just, I don't think it's going to happen now. That's bearish bullish. I mean, obviously I'm a big fan of online learning, uh, but another thing that I'm a big fan of is I, I do think that the, I, I'm a big fan of fractional work. So I think that over time people, especially white collar people who are at the top end of their game and it'll eventually apply to everyone, but people will continue to prefer to have some lifestyle balance and control over projects. And employment just doesn't give you that control. Employment is a contract where you say, I give up all of my time to whatever this person or this organization needs of me. And in exchange, I get ultimate security. And I think a lot of people are willing to give up some of that ultimate security and have a slightly less security in exchange for a lot more control over their lives and over what they want to say yes and no to. You know, you can't tell your boss no in traditional employment Um theory, you can tell your uh, consulting client, no, I don't do that, you know? So I think that that's, that's pretty exciting. Fair enough. Uh, Aditya? Yeah. Thank you, Gagan. I mean, we are almost at the close of an hour and uh, we really appreciate this. Uh, I think I, I, I knew a bunch of, uh, I came to know a bunch of new things that I haven't seen you uh, seen on your blog or on the videos that uh, uh, we saw. And Raj, thank you, Raj, for going through, you know, a lot of details about Gagan's writings. And uh, I hope everybody who is here learned something new. And tomorrow morning, I'll see you at 10.30 a.m. for our very first session. And looking forward excitedly to that session. Um, thank you, Gagan, once again. And uh, whenever you're back in Mumbai, would love to catch up. And uh, you know, uh, we, we 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 would love. Uh, we are looking forward to learning from Mavin, and uh, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll learn something uh, at Stoa from that experience as well. Thanks, a thanks lot. everyone. You're very lucky to be at the early end of this Stoa experience because I think Raj and Aditya are really thinking things. Uh, thinking through things in a different way. And I think it's really exciting. So I'm really happy for all of you and best of luck. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Gagan. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. All right. Bye. Hey, everyone. Uh, 